Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks again for joining us today for our webinar for the QPP Year 5's 2021 attestation prep. We look forward to speaking with you. We just wanted to go over some housekeeping items before we get started. We just wanted to make sure that if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free and drop those questions into the question and answer section and we will get to those questions at the end of the webinar. So please go ahead and enter those into that section. And then um, let me go through some of the legalese um, here on the screen. So the information contained here in this web presentation is for general information purposes only. And the information is provided by UK Healthcare's REC. And while we endeavor to keep the information up to date and correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind expressed or implied about the completeness, accuracy, reliability, suitability, or availability with respect to the content. So today presenting is myself, Vance, and Robin Kernel, my colleague, will be presenting today on, on the material. And for many of you, you may be aware of the Kentucky REC services that we do provide. We've now been in business for nearly 11 years um, since we started, and we we have done promoting interoperability services, um, HIPAA SRAs, uh, PCMH and PCSP consulting uh, for that recognition. We also help with value-based payment, MIP support, uh, quality improvement support and telehealth services, as well as hospital services uh, for promoting interoperability, uh, HIPAA security analysis and project management and um, hospital quality improvement as well. So for today, we wanted to talk to you guys about um, preparing to attest for 2021 for the MIPS program. So we're gonna start off with just an overview of that 2021 program requirements, some basis about that, and then dive into some pre-planning activities, and then go into this category uh, specifics of the program. And then we'll talk a little bit about some troubleshooting um, and best practices. Um, and then some resources that you can utilize as you prepare um, for attestation um, in the beginning of next year. And then lastly, how the REC can help you all uh, prepare as well. And then, like I said, we'll go over any questions um, that you all submit into that question and answer box uh, throughout the webinar. So let's get started. Let's talk a little bit about the overview of the, the MIPS program. And we're gonna start here with clinician eligibility. So there are many different eligible clinician types for the MIPS program. And you can see them listed here in the gray section. Um, you have your regular physician, which includes all different types of physicians, your MDs, your DOs, um, and you can see the rest there in the parentheses, as well as uh, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, your CNSs, CRNAs, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, um, all of those other um, eligible clinicians um, for this program. So if you have a provider or clinician of any of these types, just know that they can be eligible to submit. Um, and when I say eligible, that means they would be required if they are uh, deemed eligible. Um, so the requirements, there's two different tracks, as you all may be aware of for this program. You have your MIPS track, you have the APM track and there in the green, you're going to see the MIPS program and what constitutes eligibility. So those three different sections have to be met in order to qualify and be eligible for the MIPS program. So you would have to have the clinician type would have to meet at least $90,000 in Medicare Part B services. You would have to have at least 200 or more Medicare patients and you would have to have at least 200 or more physician fee services uh, that you provide. So all three of those elements are required in order to be eligible. In other words, have to or be required to submit for the MIPS program. Now, if you don't do the MIPS track, you would be in the APM track or that advanced alternative payment model track, and you can see the requirements there. So you would have to be in an, in an advanced APM, so be a participant in one of those models, and then you would either have to have at least 50% of your payments, meet that threshold of 50% of your payments, or at least 35% of your patients be Medicare pay patients. So that's how you would fall into that. 
Now, let's say that you are an eligible clinician type, but you do not meet um, all three of those MIPS uh, requirements, um, eligibility thresholds or, or whatnot. So what you can do, you do have that ability to opt in if you meet at least one of those three. So whether that's the 90,000 or more, or the 200 or more in patients or services. So if one of those eligible clinician types does meet at least one of these, then they have that ability to opt in for this program. And you may ask, well, why in the world do I want to opt in for this program? Well, if you are a high performing eligible clinician, then it would probably behoove you to do that so that you can get um, that um, more of a uh, positive payment adjustment. And so that would be uh, the reason that you would want to opt in. So as we talk about 2021 and it's the overview of it and the kind of the requirements and the, the category weights, et cetera. Um, we wanna look at, um, let's go down here to 2021. So if you do not submit your max penalty would be, um, you would have zero points for the program and you would receive a full 9% penalty on your Medicare payments. Um, then um, in order to avoid penalty, you'd have to meet the minimum threshold of 60 points or greater uh, to avoid the penalty for this year. Um, and in order to get that positive payment adjustment, you're looking at needing to score at least 85 points or more in order to split that $500 million pool that's out there for exceptional performers. So those are the thresholds to avoid penalties and to get higher payment adjustments. Now, how are the four MIPS categories weighted? Well, for 2021, quality is 40% of your score, cost 20, improvement activities 15, and your promoting interoperability is at 25%. Now, that's this year. If you wanna think about the future and think about next year um, and what they're proposing, you're looking at the max penalty being, again, a 9% penalty. And the threshold um, could be the median uh, or mean of all performing eligible clinicians for the program for this past couple of years. So you would be looking at that. And then an exceptional would be 85 points or greater. And then the category weights are proposed to change to 30 and 30 for the cost and quality. It would be equal weighted um, for next year that goes through. And then improvement activities would remain at 15 and PI would remain at 25% as well. Again, this slide just tells you again about the, um, the category weights for each of the other of the, of the categories that I just reviewed. Um, but it also lists the different reporting timeframes for each category that CMS requires for this program. So quality is a full year's worth of data that you have to collect and submit data for for the full 2021 program year. For your promoting interoperability and improvement activities, um, you can select 90 days of your best, uh, highest performing 90-day um, period. So just um, that's up to you uh, to see which is uh, the best, but 90 days is what you'd have to do for that. And then cost is based upon a full year as well. And then submission for the program for 2021, you'll have to do between January 1st and then March 31st of next year. So you have a few different reporting options. Um, they're the same as they were last year. You can report as either in an individual, a group, or virtual group. So individuals, you know, is under an NPI number and a tax identification number. Um, that's how that you could report, just an individual clinician or a group, and that has to be at least two or more clinicians um, under a single tax ID number. Um, and then your virtual group. So that there's, this is a rare um, item, but you do have that option to submit as a virtual group where you can combine tax IDs uh, numbers together to form a group if you have at least two or more um, uh, 
eligible clinicians in each of those tax ID numbers. Um, so that, that is an option too. So how do you submit data? How, you know, what are uh, the, how do you collect that and all those kind of things? Well, for your quality, improvement activities, costs, and promoting interoperability, you can submit um, by logging into the QPP portal directly, log in and upload your data. That is um, how you can do that for all four uh, or all three of those costs. You don't have to submit anything because that is based upon administrative claims um, that uh, CMS will review and analyze to see if you even qualify for the cost category. So you don't have to submit anything for that. But for the other three categories, on the MIPS program, you do have to, to log into that and do that. Um, that can be done um, as an individual's group, um, or you can submit through a, a third party a vendor. Um, if you want to do a, a data registry, um, can do that. A qualified clinical data registry can submit for you um, and do that. You can submit using uh, either your electronic clinical quality measures, usually that you have out of your EHR that you can pull. Or your MIPS CQMs, that's used um, for the clinical quality data registries. Um, they will use that submission collection type uh, for that. And of course, you have CMS web interface. Um, you also have some other options there as well, claims and Medicare Part B claims. Also, so you have some bonus point opportunities um, for 2021, and these will be added to your score, uh, your quality score, um, you can get one additional point for each additional high priority measure. And this is for all of those submission types, unless it, it does exclude that web interface as the slide says, but you can get an additional uh, point for each high priority measure um, and two points for each additional outcome measure. So the more, Quality measures that you can submit, the better off you're going to be, because you'll probably um, be able to submit some data on additional high priorities and outcome measures, so you could qualify for some some of those uh, bonus points. And then you can get one point per measure for end-to-end -end electronic, um, and this is all up to 10% of your quality performance category denominator. So there's not a unlimited amount of bonus points you can score, um, but up to 10%. Uh, at 10%. Now, you can also uh, get six points if you're a small practice. So, under 15 clinicians or less, you can get six points automatically added to your numerator uh, of the quality category um, for that bonus point. And then you can also earn a percentage up to 10 percentage points uh, for improvement on measures for your quality category. There's also opportunity for bonus points in the promoting interoperability category. And that is five points if you use a PDMP, which most of us in the here in the state of Kentucky probably use Casper um, and through your EHR. So if you do that, you monitor that, then you have that option too to, to get five additional points for that. So that was kind of an overview of, of, of the 2021 program in a very quick fashion. Um, and so let's talk about some pre-planning. So as you start, here we are, I can't even believe that it's almost November next week um, and we are planning for the end of the year. So what can you do as you, as you start to, to get ready for this? Well, make sure because through that submission period, which is January through March, you have that access into the HARP account for the QPP program. So if you've not gotten access um, to go in there and log in, make sure you do that. And if it's been a while since you've logged into that, I would go in and check that, make sure all your passwords are updated and get that, get that um, prepared um, as you um, get ready to attest for, for 2021. So make sure you have the access. You may have had somebody that submitted for you before that may no longer be with your organization. So it's really important that you go in there. You may have to contact the help desk at CMS to get some um, help with that to get your access. So make sure you ensure that, that you do have that. 
next there um, when it says PECOS. So PECOS is how clinicians are assigned to your organization. So if they are listed in your PECOS system, then they should show up as attached to your tax ID number. So it's very important that you update your PECOS as you know you have doctors or clinicians they come into your organization to make sure that they are added. Um, I see more um, discrepancies when a provider leaves an organization than when they come into it, because usually that's pretty um, standard that when a new provider eligible clinician comes in, they're added to your PECOS for your billing. But the problems usually come in when somebody leaves your organization. And most of the time that may be due to you know, some delay in the billing, you know, provider leaves, but there may still be billing that's going on after they leave. So they're still tied. But when their billing cycle has run through, it's important that you go ahead and remove them. So they're no longer tied to your PECO system. So check on that. And then also your quality payment program, you know, update your password as, you, as you're needed. As I just mentioned, you want to look inside the QPP portal and look at your eligible clinician list, who does CMS have tied to you? And then kind of that's a very good place to start to, where you wanna reconcile against that PECOS list that you have. So, you know, reconcile that against that, see that everything um, is what it should be um, and verify your connectivity to all your TINs. Make sure that you have, if you have multiple TINs, you'll have to make sure you have um, all your TINs in that portal and then make sure you're on that um, browser that is required for the QPP portal so you can see what's listed that um, Q uh, CMS is now supporting. So if you don't have that version, excuse me, or newer, um, you'll need to, to update to that so you can be able to use that. I um, mean, as you can see, Internet Explorer 11 is no longer supported. So, as you prepare and plan, you know, it's important that you check that eligibility list, like I just um, mentioned, and, um, and see who's connected um, and who's required to submit. You know, do you have the capabilities? Do you have the newest browser versions that are, that are supported by CMS for the portal? Um, do you have special considerations or special statuses for reweighting? That will be something else that you need to look at. Are you a small practice? Do you have PCMH recognition um, that will help for get you full credit for your improvement activities category? Um, uh, those kind of things. So you want to be looking at that. Are you an APM member? Um, are you involved in that? And what are your reporting requirements if you are? associated with an APM. What does the APM submit for you and what data will you be responsible for as an APM participant? Because even though you may be in an APM, um, that doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that, that they do everything for you. You may still have some responsibility and it will be up to you to uh, you know, communicate with your APM um, and determine what that is. Are there any exclusions or hardships that you want to, to consider and think about? There's a couple of exclusions uh, for this year due to COVID um, that you may want to consider. Um, or maybe you have a promoting interoperability hardship that you want to apply for. You have to consider all of those things out there. And then, you know, again, what's your method of submission? Are we going to submit as a group? Are we going to submit as an individuals? Or are we going to do both? Um, I think that's very important as you start to plan uh, for this next year. Another thing that you want to think about are your vendor requirements. So most people uh, that we work with, they, they have their EHR, their, their vendor with them that do their quality reporting. So it's really Im important um, that the vendor is able to, you know, produce that QRDA3. So you want to verify that, that the vendor is able to, uh, you know, get that type of a report, that type of file format, 
to you so you can upload during attestation time. You know, verify that vendor timeline. How long is it going to take for them to get that data to you? Um, start that communication now with your vendor. Um, and then ask them, what is their process? When, you know, are you all able to get this to me by? When do you have a, a, a time frame? Um, and get that process down. Um, and then uh, any type of audit support process. So if they're going to, your vendor is going to be checking your quality data to make sure it's accurate and you have the data completeness that's necessary and those kind of things. Um, so make sure you communicate with them to, so that they know that your, what your expectations are when you sh can pull that QR DA3 formatted file. Is that up to you to pull? Do you have that capability? Or is that the EHR vendor's responsibility and they'll have to pull it for you? So you need to find out those different items as you as you as you work to do this. And some other things to think about. I know I've given you a lot to think about, but um, before the end of this year, um, and as you um, are doing your attestation, make sure um, you review documents to retain uh, as a resource um, that we provide to our clients. If you are one of our clients, we do pro have provided that to you all um, where you can, um, it's like a checklist that you make sure you have everything that you need um, for the attestation and plus what you'll need to save for that six year time period in case of an audit. Also, you'll need to pull your chapel ID and I would do that, you know, right at the, the beginning of the year. So, you know, what software version you're using your vendor um, and all of those different um, modules that you use. You'll need to pull your chapel ID um, in order because um, that is necessary as you do your attestation to enter that that ID number. And then lastly here, quality again repeat myself and just say, check your vendor timelines and the capabilities. Uh, can they do the QRDA3 file? So you can have that ready to upload and um, report your availability at your uh, submission level. So be prepared for all of that. So that brings us to the next section here. Um, and it's gonna kind of dive into the uh, individual category specifics. And at this time, I am going to pass uh, control over to my colleague here, um, Miss uh, Robin Colonel, and I'm going to pass her the ball in just one second here so she can do that. Thanks, Vance, and thanks everybody for joining us. Um, just as a quick reminder while giving me slide control. Just put your questions that you've got down in our Q&A. I noticed we've already got one in there and we will do our best to address those at the end of the presentation. And if for some reason we can't get to them during our hour today, we will certainly touch on those um, by a phone call afterwards. So Vance has gave us lots of information about the program so far, I'm going to talk specifically about some category specifics and then maybe give you some resources and some tips and tricks later as well. So briefly, you'll see some slides like this um, over the next couple of slides, so I won't go into detail with all of them, but um, for all of the categories, data validation is very important. And so we talk about that in, in each category, but <clears throat> We've talked about data validation on prior webinars as well, but when you talk about data validation, you're verifying that the information that you are reporting includes the correct patients in your numerator and denominator, that you're not omitting anyone, you're not blocking any information, and you're not missing any codes. So we strongly encourage you to validate your data periodically through the year, and that includes verifying your measures, that you're using the correct specification sheet, to evaluate your measure on, that you've got all the appropriate diagnosis codes included in your denominators and pulling the correct patients into your numerator. You're verifying how it's extracting your data and then how do you want to submit your, your measure information later as well. And then what's that data going to look like? Everything that we talk about today as far as checklists and keeping information and validation, it's all about supporting 
your documentation or what you've uploaded when it comes time for an audit. While audits seem somewhat rare, we have had clients be audited for the MIPS program in the past, and we <clears throat> certainly don't want you to experience that and then have to suffer penalties or have to pay money back. So keep that in mind. When you're reporting any information, you want to make sure that you can support it later through an audit. So for the quality category specifically, you want to maintain copies of your reports that you've submitted. You want to make sure that you have a list of the NPIs who were included in that during that time period, and then maybe screenshots of, of when you submitted that data so that you have a date and time stamp on that. And then preliminary scoring, you can pull that feedback down once that's released. And then if necessary, maybe screenshots from how you generated that report within your EHR. And when we talk about audit support documentation, you want to maintain that for at least six years. And we encourage you to keep it in multiple formats or multiple locations. So maybe you want to print a paper copy, keep it in a binder with whatever program year it is, and then maybe an electronic copy as well, or maybe share it on a thumb drive with another colleague. When we look at quality category itself and attestation tips, just a reminder, you do have to submit on at least six measures. One of those must be a high priority or an outcome measure. For 2021, we see a couple new administrative claim measures. In the past, only groups have been evaluated on these. Um, what we've seen now from the latest specification and information sheets is that it could apply to individuals, groups, or virtual groups. You must meet a case minimum. Those two particular administrative claim measures are evaluated by CMS, so it's not something that um, we can calculate for you or that you may be able to calculate for yourself, but just be aware that it is possible to be evaluated on hospital-wide 30-day all-cause unplanned readmissions and complication rates for total hip and total knee arthroplasty. We've had some providers in the past elect to use their um, CAP survey as part of their quality submission. If you were going to do that, that needed to have been elected by June 30th. That is not an election that once you do it, it'll be considered every year thereafter. You do have to go into your QPP portal and select to use CAPS for MIP survey as part of your quality every year by June 30th. And that's actually submitted from your third party system, whoever's collecting your patient surveys. Vance mentioned some of the files necessary, one of those being a QRDA3 file. Um, if that's if you've not used that before for your submission to quality, maybe you've submitted through claims before, but uh, now you're electronic and you have this option, or maybe you're using the registry, be sure that the file that either the registry is going to send you to submit or the one you're trying to build is in fact in the correct format. You don't want to wait till March 31st and learn that it's not. So um, if you're working with us as a client, then that's something that we can help you with and we can evaluate it. While we can't actually read it and make sure it'll submit to the page, we can tell you whether or not it's in the correct file format. Um, when we talk about improvement activities checklist, so <clears throat> while the submission for this category is easy enough, I mean, it's a, you can just simply attest that you're participating in it. There are some requirements regarding the number of clinicians participating in that activity to be eligible at the group level. You need to document your start and stop dates. Identify what form of submission you're going to use, whether you're doing it manually through attestation, maybe your EMR vendor can submit for you. Um, again, as part of audit support, you want to make sure that you're using the appropriate data validation form for whatever activity that you're using and those are available on the QPP website under the resource library. You want to make sure that you maintain that list of NPIs that are participating in that activity or locations. We encourage you to put it at the NPI level so that it, you're sure that you have your 50% of eligible clinicians tied to it. Any necessary screenshots, of course, that we talked about for submission and then also for how you maintain that activity. So if it's something that's been recorded in your EMR, You've got documentation of how that's pulled, but if it's something that's been manual process for maintaining, you'll want to make sure that you keep a copy of, of that particular activity in that report. Again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you want to keep all of your audit documentation for at least six years. 
As far as a list of to-dos for improvement activities, uh, I mentioned the data validation tool. So if you've chosen an activity, maybe it's different from the activity you chose last year, or you know maybe it's the same one you've been using. You still want to do that, review that data validation worksheet. Um, CMS makes changes and updates, and sometimes removes things each year. So you don't want to just assume that what you did last year was fine. And then their time frames for participation in that activity needs to match. So uh, if you're going to use the 90-day activity <clears throat> or 90-day reporting for clinician A and you're reporting at the individual level or at the group level, clinician B is doing that same activity, they've got to have the same time frame. Then um, PS, uh, PCMH and PCSP requirement, it's still at least 50% of your sites that's registered within PECOS uh, must be uh, certified in order to be able to use that as your improvement activity. One of the things that's not necessarily new, but it's more prominent for this year, 2020 and 2021, uh, has been the use of telehealth. And so if you've added telehealth services to your practice, there's multiple improvement activities that you could attest for, and therefore you're not creating any new work when you look at that. So review that improvement activities list for telehealth particular activities and there's a variety to pick from and then maybe you can use that as your improvement activity and you don't have to dig so deep for some other activity um, but the list for improvement activities is uh, i think there are 112 or 115 activities on there and very seldom does anybody have to come up with something new something that they're not doing already that's included in there For the promoting interoperability category, make sure that those uh, particular measures that require numerators and denominators can show that they've been generated from your EHR. What we've seen with some various systems is not necessarily when they run their report for PI, it doesn't always show the name of the EMR vendor. And so part of that attestation is that you are running reports from a certified vendor. And in those types of situations, you may have to actually keep documentation of how you obtain that report from your system. So you would grab screenshots throughout each step, and that would be what you would maintain in your audit support book. Uh, if you're using a third party system to aggregate data, you would want to keep all of your work related to that aggregation as well. And then for those that are attesting to this, pro, um, prescription drug monitoring program and for those of us in Kentucky we know that's CASPER you need to show how you're accessing that system through your EHR another thing with reporting at the group level those reports need to include the tax ID for the group and it wouldn't hurt to have date and time stamp reports that shows all the providers that are included in that tax ID for that reporting period as well One of the things to think about with the promoting interoperability category is this automatic reweight override. And what that's referring to is certain clinicians um, and pretty much anyone outside of a physician have the option for an automatic reweight. This won't be lasting for every year, but it's still in place for now. And so when you go to a test, and if you go to select this category, you'll get a pop-up message that alerts you that you're eligible for automatic reweight. What that essentially means is that that 25% that PI category contributes to can be moved over to your quality category, and that category would become 65% of your final score. If you elect to say, no, I don't want to take the reweight, and you go and put your um, information in for PI, and you realize that you have a low score, you can't go back and get that automatic reweight applied. So that's a decision that you need to make before attestation. If you're working with us as a regional extension center client, we have had that discussion through our gap analysis program, and so we're helping you with that. So just keep that in mind that if you elect to not take that reweight, you cannot go back and change it. It's there for that particular performance year. Now next year it changes, but just keep in mind that when you go to a test, if you've selected um, to bypass that reweight, you can't get it back. Some folks can build a QRDA3 file that will include promoting interoperability information. 
what you need to consider is that it must include the ONC questions at the beginning of this category. And those questions include about information blocking, did you complete an SRA, and um, <clears throat> participation in the ONC. It'll populate the data, but it won't score the category is the problem. So if you are um, if you can build one for PI, but it doesn't include those questions, then we would just encourage you to manually enter your data so that you can attest to those questions and get your scoring. Uh, if you're attesting to these public health registries and you want to use bi-directional immunization registry as one of your public health measures, one, you need to have the bi-directional agreement signed. Uh, actually, all of these agreements need to be signed within 60 days of the reporting period, but in addition to the bi-directional agreement, you need to be given immunizations in your practice. If you don't give immunizations, then you can't use that as a registry, so just keep that in mind ahead of time. That was Immunizations were one that were signed up early when meaningful use came out 10, 11 years ago, and sometimes we don't think about um, some of the specifications that go behind that program. Uh, if you want to run a group, or if you can't run a group report for promoting interoperability, but you want to be able to submit your PI to group, this is the one category that you can aggregate information together manually for your providers, just maintain that documentation of what their individual reports look like and your math of where you've added those together. So we've talked about specifics for categories. We're going to talk about some of the errors that we see and some best practice sharing here. So attestation time, you can start attestation in any category. So you get on there you know, January 2nd or 3rd, and you're just kind of perusing the site, and well, I know what I'm gonna do for improvement activities. You can go straight to that category. You can select your improvement activity, and you're done. There's no submit button. There's anything like that. It's just there. That's when we recommend you take a screenshot, because that captures the date and time that you entered your data in case there's any discrepancy later. Don't submit data for any category if you intend to claim a hardship for that category. So if you have submitted your extreme and uncontrollable circumstance hardships or your PI hardships or whatever, and you've done that by the due date, which would be December 31st, um, it, and you don't want to submit data for that and void your hardship, make sure you just don't click on that category. That'll keep you out of it. Also, if you go to a category and you're submitting data um, and you upload a file, and you identify that that file has errors in it, you can delete that from your side, but it doesn't mean it's deleted from CMS's view. So they do have a way to audit and track how many times we've been in that system. So just keep that in mind that if you upload a new file, grab screenshots of when you uploaded that so that you get scored on the correct file. And then documentation, um, I've mentioned screenshots, I think like a dozen times already, but it's important because that is your proof of when you submitted your information. I mean, just like right now, we grab a screenshot, it's 1238 p.m. on October 27th. That's your proof. You can't make that up later and you can't alter it. We suggest that you do save all your information that you've submitted electronically, but also use easy to recognize file naming conventions. You know, we've helped folks who've had multiple changes in practice managers and they're trying to come back and figure out where information was. And it, Sometimes what makes sense to one doesn't make sense to all. So we encourage you just to do something simple like MIPS 2021 and then put everything in that file. And then printing hard copies. I know we don't want to, you know, kill trees and we don't want to waste paper and ink, but sometimes computers crash and we're living in a world of high technology, but we want a backup plan just in case. And again, you're keeping that for six years. We mentioned some resources earlier. Uh, we've got them all on one slide here, so you can um, right now capture a screenshot of this if you want, but um, you have your QPP submission portal. That login is um, specifically tied to you personally, so it's not a shared login for the organization. If you haven't got your login yet, then you would use the HARP system, which is an acronym within an acronym. Um, but if you had an old uh, quality net, and you haven't logged in in a while, you're going to use HARP to get your login back for the QPP program. On the QPP portal page, they have what's called participation status lookup, and so you can do a real quick search by provider NPI, 
and look at their eligibility requirements, any special statuses, if they're a part of an advanced alternative payment model. It'll give you lots of good information there. Uh, it won't give you um, penalty information or anything like that on past years, but it will tell you participation levels uh, or what's required for this current year and what they've had in the past. We mentioned just real briefly, I think the CHAPL website is actually the Certified Health Product List website for the PI category. You will have to enter in a CHAPL ID. We don't recommend you waiting until the day of attestation to do that because some systems are modular built and so you have to add different parts and pieces to get the required, um, required base requirements, required base met requirements and so <clears throat> Sometimes it takes a little bit of time and it may make a few phone calls to get it. And then of course, Kentucky REC, we have a website that has the microservices page and so you can find lots of good information there as well. And then just briefly to touch on some things related to COVID relief, um, Vance mentioned that earlier in the presentation. So for 2020, right now we have a targeted review deadline that's been extended to November 29th. So if you have not reviewed your final feedback report, you please do that so soon. Um, we've saw a couple instances where folks were um, elected not to submit data, or maybe they'd filled out a hardship, but somehow or another CMS recognized that there was claims data and they scored organizations on that. And then because they didn't meet penalty, they or did not meet threshold, they received a penalty. So if you have not, looked at your final feedback report for 2020, please do that sooner or later. Um, it's in the October already and November 29th will be here before we know it. And the extreme and uncontrollable circumstances hardship application is available. It will be through December. COVID-19 is a reason that you could claim a hardship. If you're going to do that, we encourage you to do that now, but also be more specific than just saying COVID-19. It may be that your clinic's been closed for part of the year or your staff has been out or just multiple things there. So just keep that in mind. Another tidbit uh, for folks who have been scored in the past using facility-based scoring, you may wanna utilize the EUC option this year what we've learned is that those providers who are on facility-based scoring receive scores for quality and cost based on the hospital that they're tied to value-based score. And CMS is not giving a value-based score uh, for hospitals for the program year that this would be impacted by. And so we don't want anyone to assume that, oh, I don't have to submit this year, my facility-based scoring will pick up when actually it won't. So if that's a question and you're working with us as an REC client, um, we can double check that for you all. And then as option, just a little bit more about this EUC exception. Um, these are the folks that can apply, the participants as MIPS eligible ECs, if you're submitting as a group or what we call the tax ID level, virtual groups, and even this year, APM entities are eligible to request an exemption. Um, you can have any or all categories reweighted, and then some folks have an automatic reweight, and then others may not. So to complete this application, you would log in under your QPP portal. There'll be a tab there on the left in the dark blue banner for exceptions and hardships. And then you would select the hardship that you're applying for. Some folks just do the PI hardship for that category. And then if you're going to do other categories, you'd want to do the extreme and uncontrollable circumstances. CMS will respond to your request by email. And we have seen some folks with the PI hardship get an immediate response. We saw others with extreme and uncontrollable circumstances not get an, an immediate response. So just keep um, check in the status of your application by signing into QPP. Once it's approved, it's actually listed on your QPP portal as well. So we've gotten to the questions and answer portion of our webinar today. I'm gonna um, give Vance some rights back, but we're both gonna stay on the call here to help answer those questions. 
Thank you, Robin, and lots of good information here. As you guys are thinking some of uh, uh, some additional questions, please go ahead and enter those into the question and the answer box, and we will get to those in just a second. As you all are doing that, we just wanted to kind of uh, prepare you guys or remind you of some upcoming webinars that we are having. Uh, we were will be speaking about the 2022 final rule review. Um, when that is released tentatively, November 17th at this at this time, that may change depending upon when the final rule is released. It has not been released yet, so um, but we will do a final rule review. Um, and then in December, uh, preparing for the program year close, that will be on December the 15th at noon Eastern Standard Time. So be on the lookout for that. As we're thinking about doing attestation and submitting for MIPS for the quality payment program, um, how can the REC help you? So we help many clients throughout the state uh, prepare for the MIPS program, MIPS submission, APM submission. Um, we help um, by really digging into your data, uh, looking at your quality reports, your PI reports, um, having in discussions with you regarding what type of clinical improvement activities um, you guys are doing, and so that we can perform um, a detailed gap analysis over four different categories uh, to see where your current uh, baseline is, uh, what, what areas uh, need some improvement, um, what strengths are and kind of work on those gaps um, to get to the achievement that you're looking for. We do that um, by a recommended action plan um, and suggestions that we can provide. Um, you would be assigned a personalized uh, individual advisor um, for your uh, organization um, to help you as you prepare for submission throughout the year to really reach the maximum uh, score that you can so you can get the best positive uh, potential positive payment adjustment um, that's available for you. So as a client um, here at the REC, you do have exclusive access to different content um, that we provide for different resources, um, your own exclusive webinars. This is a public webinar today, so it's open to the public, but we do have uh, other webinars that are client only. Uh, that we give personalized um, um, education and additional resources um, for preparation for the quality payment program, as well as help for your attestation prep uh, to prepare for that and support you during that um, submission and attestation. Um, we provide the different resources, whether that's a tip sheet, uh, one pagers, um, and some audit support. So if you are a client for 2021, and let's say in five years, CMS decides to audit you for program year 2021. Um, then we, the REC, would be able to support you during that since you were a client during that time frame. Also, there is so much information and legislation and rules that are, um, you know, put out there in the universe every year. So we help we help with that. We help with your eligibility, determining what clinicians are eligible for your your group, you know, help make suggestions on whether you should do group or individuals. Um, we also help with that final rule and a proposed rule to give information on what's coming up for the next year so you can start preparations early and any special impacts such as COVID or those hardships that we can help maybe that would benefit you um, and make suggestions and also help when that final performance feedback is released in that mid summer around July, that's normal uh, that that is released. So we can help review that with you to see if there's anything that uh, needs and if a targeted review is necessary, then we can help assist you with that as well. And so if you have any questions of regarding how uh, we can help you, any want more specific details or have some other questions, um, please reach out to us. There's several ways here listed on this slide that you can reach to us, whether it's our website, our Facebook page, Twitter account. Um, we have a LinkedIn account and also just our phone number is listed there. Um, 
or email. So please, you know, reach out to us and we're glad to provide you with some additional information on that. So with that, let's jump back up here to our questions page um, and see what kind of questions we have. Of, um, and Robin and I will try to answer these questions for you guys and, um, and we'll go from there. I will start off with, we've had a couple of questions regarding uh, slides and recording. So just to let you know, we will be emailing um, the recording uh, link to everybody uh, in a few days. So it may take up depending on when we get that download completed, or maybe a, a week or so. But those that have attended today, you will receive a recording of this um, to answer that question. Some other questions, we've uh, had a couple of them come in regarding um, the PDMP um, and how to get credit for that. Um, and so I will start with this, uh, Robin, and please jump in if uh, I missed anything um, and to clarify. But I think I was a little confusing when I said using Casper. So what I meant by that is you have to, in order to get credit for that bonus for your PDMP, you have to prescribe at least one opioid through your uh, through your EHR, um, and then you use data from your EHR to query that PDMP, which in this case would be the Casper report. So that means that your EHR would have to query the Casper. So if you are able to do that, you would have to show uh, be able. You would just attest that you do that, and then if you were ever audited, you would have to prove how your EHR did um, provide that, that query uh, through Casper. So it, would ha it can't be separate, it would have to be through your EHR. So Robin, is that, did that seem to be more, uh, give some information or did I miss anything there? No, I think you did fine. And I was pulling up the spec sheet too while you were um, looking at the, or responding there and then I don't know if there's anything else that we could add to that, but just keep in mind that we know that you can go outside the system and qu query Casper directly, but just keep in mind there should be a way within your EHR to do that, whether it's a hot button or a hot link or something like that to show that it's been done. Um, yeah. So well. if they had like a link within their EHR, they hit a button mm -hmm. and then it t took them outside of the EHR to Casper. That would yeah. count, correct? That would work. Yes, it'll work. Mm -hmm. So if you have that capability, then you could get credit for that. So I hope that answered that question. Let's, I think we had a couple. One, do you all have national benchmarking for MIPS adjustments? Um, wondering percentage of penalties and tiers for positive adjustments. Now CMS just released some information on that data. Um, and we can forward that to you um, and make sure that, that you get that information. But they did come out with some with a study and it gave some percentages of who got penalties and what the positive adjustments were and what the negative, what the penalties were. So um, it will, it will um, give you that information. And so we'll have that's to for 2020. That. Just keep in mind it's for 2020. Yes, 2020. So that's not. It's not current, it, it's the most recent, I guess, but that will, um, it'll be a little bit behind, but it, you'll at least have that data. Let's see here. Does the PI exception application have to be completed through the QPP portal this year? Robin, you wanna answer that one? As far as I know, that's the only way you can do it. Um, that's the only way my practices that's participated have ever done that. So if there's a different way that I don't, then somebody else that's on the panelist can speak up. But um, you generally have to do that through your login on the QPP portal to submit that exception application. Yeah, that's that's what I thought too, Robin. Um, another question that, that we have is, so are you saying that EHR has to query Casper for electronic prescribing? So we're saying that you have to have access to do that through your EHR. So when the provider gets ready to order that prescription, that controlled drug, there should be an option there to query Casper. Whether it's, like we said, a hot link, like there's some kind of 
um, button or a place to click that takes you out of it, uh, out of the EHR to pull for it. The EHR itself won't query Casper because we know that you have to have individual logins for that, but you should have a way within the system to to get to that program without having to go outside of it and logging into the website and all that. That's what we're saying. Yes, that was a um, good answer, Robin. Um, reading through some other questions. I don't see any additional questions at this time. So if you have any, go ahead and enter that now. Um, we want to thank you guys for joining us today. Like I said, we will be sending out the recordings of this uh, to you. Um, and then uh, I'll reach out, make sure that you get information um, on the on the, the the 2020 data for the percentage of penalties and uh, positive payment adjustments so that you will um, have that information. I'll make sure the person that asked that gets that information. Now, there's a question about auditing supporting documentation, and they're using a program called IntelliCode to audit their providers. So I don't know that either of us are familiar with that system, but when we talk about your supporting documentation and audits, we're talking about CMS selecting providers to, to be audited, and it could be audited on a particular measure within a specific category or a particular improvement activity or things like that. So that's an audit from CMS that you would receive by mail. It'll be a certified document, and then CMS would indicate to you what provider, what tax ID, whatever, whomever they're auditing, and they'll specifically tell you what measure you're being audited on, whether it's a PI specific or if it's a quality measure. I mean, we saw folks audited on documentation of current meds one time, and then they will ask for a, the way that process works is they'll tell you what measure it is, they may ask you to send them a patient list back, and then they'll select from that list uh, some patients and they wanna see documentation that you in fact did document that patient's medications. That's the type of audit that we're talking about. Um, so when you attest to a measure that you've got the correct numerator and denominator, just be prepared that CMS could ask you for that patient list later. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but feel free to reach out to us or call us at the REC and one of our advisors, whether me, Vance, or anybody else that's on this participant list can answer that question for you. Yes. Well, Robin, I don't see any other questions? So I'll take that, um, that we don't have any, but if, like Robin said, if you think of any, please reach out to us and we're happy to get that information to you. Um, thanks for joining us again today. Um, best wishes to everyone as you start preparing for 2021. Um, and we're here to help. So please contact us if you have any questions or would like further assistance. Thank you.